Hello there, my name is Watson Kasturi. I'm going to be giving this KubeCon Tech Talk along with Nivedita Vishwanath on high performance networking for distributed DL training in production KAS. This presentation is about sharing our experience in creating 800 GPU cluster using 100 DGX over Rocky protocol using Ethernet networks. I'll cover the first section and Nivedita will go into the second section, concluding with performance numbers. So the agenda of this tech talk is broadly split into two sections. The top level is a gray colored boxes, which indicate control plane operations and setup, which we have to do. And the bottom level side is the green boxes indicate the network, the speeds and the feeds, how do we integrate RDMA, SRIV, and then the performance numbers coming out of this exercise. So obviously the stack has to be laid out first for the compute environment. And then we have to launch the DL applications as a container in the KAS environment and collect the metrics coming out of the telemetry to monitor how the cluster is performing. Along with fairness, multi-user, multiplexed environment so that the users can get a fair share of the compute. The multi-node data center consideration has to be you know, involved here for the design of the cluster itself and depend, depends on the heating and the cooling, the rack layout, along with the five networks, which are listed here, what we call as the east-west, north-south, IPMI, storage, and internet networks. The EDR, HDR, MDR, and PCI are bandwidth related. The EDR is 100 gig, HDR is 200 gig, and MDR is 400 gig links. And how do they actually communicate GPU to GPU in the east-west direction? And how do we integrate the nodes, RDMA, SRRV, and CNR into the Kubernetes cluster? And then we'll conclude with production, KAS experience, and also the performance in the second half. I'm not going to go into the details of this uh, listing here, um, but you can see there are five networks listed here. Um, there are speeds and feeds uh, discussion, another design consideration in a data center. And Nivedita will cover the production Kubernetes cluster uh, multi-node workloads and also the CNI control flow. So what is the multi-node cluster MNKS? MNKS is a 100-node DGX1 V100 cluster connected by the Ethernet links for GPU to GPU communication over the Rocky V2 protocol. We use RDMA extensively to move the data and the cluster is set up such that we can provide horizontal scaling of DGX in the data center, subjected to the condition of rack space, power, cooling, and heating. The orchestration is done by the KAS controller, while the jobs are actually time shared, as I said earlier, controlled by the custom batch scheduler for fairness of the GPU as well as the time being used on the GPU. Data scientists are the users. We're running the ML jobs. It could be a PyTorch or TensorFlow inside the container, or they are getting launched by the KAS in these worker nodes. So when you set up a cluster like this, there is an expectation of the KPI. And here is what we have experienced um, and what you have considered as a good KPI for ML clusters. We need to design low latent MNK clusters and it's one half network to keep the cluster design simple. And what we also observe is in, instead of being 16 GPU on a one node, we, if we run a 1400 GPU, we have a improvement of factor of 70X. And this is specifically on the ML perf performance. Faster model convergence for the data center means faster performance numbers coming down into increasing productivity and also converging faster into the accurate states when you have 8 billion parameters to operate with. The network needs to be matched the multi-node cluster GPU targets so they don't become a bottleneck. 
This particular picture has two images sandwiched, the one on the left and the right. The left image is inside the hardware part cluster, and you can see the perforations on the, on the floor where the airflow will come out and push it out. On the right side picture is on the back side, uh, we call it a power side, where the heat will come out and then leave the data center. There are basically six switches here, each of them 128 ports, 100 gig switches. And there are four rings we'll talk about in the, in the subsequent slides. And two of them are used for leaves to go up the north-south traffic. There are terminologies used in this tech talk, so I've listed them here. Um, I'm not going to go through them, but you can refer them if there are terminologies which you don't understand. In a multi node cluster, these are the building blocks moving from left to right. Um, there's a data center, there's power cooling racks. How do you do the placement of the DGX and the CPU nodes? And this is typically done by the side ops and the networking team. And then there is perimeter network, and then the pod network is right here which has a KHS and a BGP uh, layout in the switching along with the VLAN on the lower end. Uh, you do have monitoring metrics and logging associated with both the networks as well as the user jobs. And this particular block is where the users actually get to see and interact extensively using CLI, GUI, and launch their container jobs in this particular infrastructure. The KHS actually controls the worker nodes and there is an API server obviously associated with this. This particular picture talks about five different networks, uh, which are the component of the traffic inside the cluster. There's IPMI to control the BMC and the host, and there's KDS control traffic going north south, and the, the API servers can be located anywhere. This particular green thing, GPU to GPU network, is a short span in cluster bandwidth heavy, which is where all the um, NDR, EDR, HDR traffic actually flows. And they're very sensitive to RTT between the nodes. And you want them to be non blocking and ensure that there's performance in this particular network. And that needs to interact with storage network. It can be in the leaf of the spine to fetch the data and also write the results and the logs. And obviously, the data center needs access to the internet uh, for pulling images or data sets or for other purposes. This elliptical orbit has 10 blocks, which are listed here. Each block represents a rack, and each rack has like 10 DGXs. They all go into the inside ring. There are four rings of the donuts listed here with different color. And they are, these are called nickel rings, and four of them actually connect to the NICs in the DGX ones. Each of the ring connects to one of the NICs in each of the DGXs, and they form a ring. And so each node is only one hop away. There is uplink associated with this, which is about 6.4 terabits if you need to go north-south to go to the storage or other needs. But when the GPUs are communicating with each other, they are only one hop away with low latent uh, round trip time. Many of you are aware of this core spine leaf model. Um, this is basically the tar switching for north south, and the 100 nodes are stuck here in the, in the racks with six NICs, four of them used for the east west, and two of them for the north south. And as I indicated earlier, GPU to GPU traffic is significant, and you want this to be high performance, low latent network. This is the backside of one of the units, um, which is called A100. Um, I'm just giving you a, a sample of how the east west will connect. There are four here um, on each side of this box. Um, in the DGX1, um, there's going to be four links, and in the A100, it'll be 800 links. The storage network will move north-south um, through these particular links, and then the traditional IPN network is listed here. This is a layer seven stack, which most of you are familiar with. Um, and this talks about the infinity band and the Rocky 
And as you can see, um, only the lower layers are a little bit different uh, from the from the L4 onwards. It's identical, and one can use either the Rocky Ethernet and InfiniBand, and you can reconfigure the NICs. Obviously, the switches has to be different between the two networks. This is a little bit expanded version of the the same picture, but with uh, with a stack here. Um, going through the EDP in the version two, and an InfiniBand network layer in the version one. We discussed this uh, particular slide earlier about EDR, HDR, MDR, um, 100 gig, 200 and 400 gig, and how do they relate to the PCI bus? Um, do they saturate the PCI bus? As you can see, as you move up the, the, the bandwidth and the line rate increases, they're going to saturate this PCI bus 3.0, and you have to move up to the 4.0 network. So this is a good slide to actually relate uh, what the nodes can do in terms of the PCI standards associated with the NIC bandwidth and what the expectation for the GPUs are when you operate the cluster. This is another view of the network uh, from seeing inside the box. There's a motherboard and lots of memory and the kubelet and the container runs here. Um, there is a, a not so traffic going through this particular NIC and the Kubernetes actually operates that along with the metrics being collected here. This particular complex is actually the east-west complex where the switching happens. You can use IB or Rocky associated with the GPU for each node. And you have to extrapolate this for 100 nodes in the cluster. So what are the design considerations um, for multi-node cluster? So aligned with Ethernet switching model, interoperability and ubiquitous Ethernet network is, uh, is a vehicle where you can install this. Avoid placement logic, fundamentally ECMP and others um, two-layer um, routing will have some hiccups. So we prefer to do one hop L2 network. And so we don't have complexity while you're operating the cluster. This particular one is a 100 node cluster, but you can even have longer cables. Um, you can actually expand that to, to more racks. And as I've indicated there um, in one of the pictures, it's a 16 rack uh, structure, but you can expand it to 25, 50, as long as there is switching structure. Align and leverage NCCL, which is a nickel ray structure um, in the libraries to avoid switching congestion and output ports. Nickel does do three uh, rings and it arbitrates and ensure that uh, the traffic flows smoothly um, while you're actually bringing up the cluster. Avoid generic storage traffic mixing um, for the RDMA nickel ring so that um, we have a clean network on the east west. And that actually integrates with the SR, SRIV CNI and um, the RDMA interfaces are actually exposed inside the container. So this is a traditional switching structure which you, most of you are familiar with. So edge spine, leaf and torque. The storage can decide um, uh, reside very close to the leaf if you want to have a, a local traffic or move it up a little bit into the spine. And the IPM at all actually connects it to the BMC um, and the switches to manage. So I'm going to pause here and hand this off to Nivedita to talk about uh, the control plane. And uh, Nivedita will conclude with the performance. Thank you. Thank you, Watson. Hello, everyone. I'm Nivedita, and I'm glad to be co-presenting this session. Now, Watson talked about the best practices and network protocols to be considered while designing a high-performance multi-node cluster in a data center. I would like to talk about how we leveraged those design decisions to enable high-speed networking in Kubernetes. Now, we have an on-prem production Kubernetes cluster 
that is mainly used by our internal users. And most of these internal users are research scientists that are running deep learning applications that often require hundreds of GPUs. We have enabled support for running multi-node workloads through a custom job controller, the upstream MPI operator, and a custom batch scheduler. The custom job controller registers a custom resource definition or a CRD for a multi-node job with the API server. Now, users can submit multi-node jobs through the CRD, either through the CLI or UI. And when a multi-node job is submitted, the custom job controller watches for these events and creates an MPI job for the multi-node job. The MPI operator then creates the pods for the MPI job, and these pods form a gang, which is then scheduled by the custom batch scheduler. Now the container image has the necessary libraries for the framework MPI and Nickel. And when all the pods are running as a gang, they communicate through Nickel. Now the production cluster we have is a shared cluster as Watson mentioned, it's made up of 100 DGX1 nodes. And since this is a shared cluster, we have implemented features like gang scheduling, starvation handling, backfilling, as well as support for user quotas, DRF, and dynamic job priority through our custom scheduler. We have a logging and monitoring pipeline that feeds into dashboards and alerts and helps with day-to-day -day operations. Now, in order to run distributed deep learning applications, high-speed networking is extremely crucial. But before we go into how we enable high-speed networking, let's take a high-level look at the topology of a DGX1 node. Each DGX1 has eight V100 GPUs that are interconnected by NVLink in our cluster. It has four Mellanox 100 gig NICs for our DMA and dual copper 10 gig Ethernet NICs. The four RDMA interfaces form a rocky network or a ring that is used by Nickel for GPU to GPU communication using the one hop VLAN switching fabric. Nickel can detect the fast interconnects between GPUs, both within and across nodes. And the Nickel ring formation also helps with output port congestion at the cluster. Now this process is described in detail in the link that is shared on the slide. The dual ethernet NICs on the DGX1 node are primarily used for storage and Kubernetes control traffic. So this gives us two distinct networks, one for Rocky and one for storage or control, resulting in an isolated environment for performance-centric workloads. To enable high-speed networking for multi-node jobs, we need to make the multiple interfaces on the host available inside the Kubernetes pod. This is achieved through a combination of the SRIOV device plugin and multi-CNI. The SRIOV device plugin discovers the RDMA interfaces on the host and registers them with Kubelet. The RDMA interfaces can then be managed by Kubelet as allocatable resources. So once a pod that is requesting these RDMA interfaces in its resource spec gets scheduled onto a node, Kubelet starts moving the network resources from the host namespace to the pod namespace through the registered CNI plugin. Now, since the DGX1 node has multiple types of network interfaces, we use Multis as the CNI plugin, which delegates its call to the SRIOV CNI plugin and the Flannel plugin. SRIOV CNI configures the RDMA interfaces in a pod, while Flannel configures the default H0 interface. All the components in this flow are upstream components that have been used with minor customizations. Now for each physical RDMA interface on the host, we create two SRIOV interfaces or virtual functions. 
So a DGX1 node that has four RDMA interfaces will result in eight virtual functions. Each full node pod will only use four of these eight VFs, one corresponding to each physical interface, and the remaining four VFs are used for monitoring and storage network creation. Also, the affinity of any VF to a particular GPU is decided at runtime by Nickel. The first image on the slide highlights the four physical RDMA interfaces of the host, and the second image highlights the four SRIOV interfaces that are created from the physical interfaces and renamed in a pod. Since this is a production cluster, we are constantly monitoring the traffic on the RDMA interfaces. This is done by capturing the values of the transmit and receive counters. And the image shown here shows the traffic that you typically see while running a machine learning application. Now we often see a sawtooth-like pattern, and this is a result of the two phases that generally occur in every epoch of an ML app, the two phases being the compute phase and the communicate phase. In the compute phase, the GPU workers are fetching from storage, performing computation, creating MPI barriers, and there is no communication with other GPU workers, hence the dip or the valley in the traffic. In the communicate phase, the GPU workers share the result of the previous phase with other workers, and this results in the peak in the pattern that you see. Now, we ideally want to maximize the compute time and minimize the communicate time in an algorithm to improve epoch training efficiency. In addition to monitoring the RDMA traffic, we also run nickel all reduce routine and other collective primitives as part of a pre-flight check prior to running multi-node workloads. Nickel all reduce test captures the average bus bandwidth and it's run with different configurations where we vary the MPI rank per node, the number of threads per rank, the number of GPUs per thread and so on. From the table and graph, we see that even with increasing number of nodes, we get a pretty consistent average bus bandwidth of about 45 Gbps, where the theoretical light rate is 50 Gbps. Here we also have captured the performance of a PyTorch BERT job that we have run in two different phases. And we see that the throughput scaling, which is measured in sequences per second, is close to the ideal value, even when using up to 256 concurrent GPUs in a shared multi-node cluster. So in conclusion, um, we wanted to share some of our findings and observations. For DC placement and design, Following the best practices will result in an environment that gives good performance for AI ML workloads. Where bandwidth is concerned, comprehensive understanding of the network flows will provide guidance for designing multi-node clusters without congestion at EDR and future HDR NDR rates. What's to be kept in mind is HDR NDR rates are applicable for TOR switches as well and not for DC to DC connectivity alone. Regarding the Kubernetes control plane, we found that the upstream components and plugins in the community are easy to adopt and customize. And by implementing features like gang scheduling, starvation handling, quotas in our custom batch scheduler, we were able to achieve seamless scheduling of multi-node workloads while maintaining fairness for end users. I would like to thank the entire team at NVIDIA for their help and support. And I would also like to thank KubeCon for giving us this opportunity to show our work. Thank you.